You know, writer's block is a pain. I start a script, ready to get going, stare at a blank Google Doc for 10 minutes, write three lines, and then repeat the process. Always feels a bit like I'm being petty, too, you know? Like, oh no, I can't think of a funny joke. My life truly is filled with toil and suffering. But then I think to myself some advice that's always helped me out. When you're struggling to think of something creative for a faction you care about, you just gotta get stupider. Like, as far deep and rock bottom as you can get, and then break out the pickaxes. That kind of stupid. So with that in mind, green skins of Warhammer. Orcs and goblins, or grots if you're partial to 40k over fantasy. They're stupid. They're belligerent. The only reason they might not punch you in the face is because they've already kicked you in the balls. Or they're too busy doing it to someone else. Might makes right and all that's worth doing is fighting in one way or another, and they believe this is completely acceptable. Even the goblins on the lower end of the totem pole don't complain about the orcs because they think this is wrong. They complain because they're weaker than the orcs, which means they get the worst of things. And because belief is what it is in Warhammer, this ideology naturally shapes the spiritual world. For the orcs, it has given them two gods that give them rewards and motivations to keep doing the only things worth doing in their eyes. Fightin', winnin', and lootin'. Gork and Mork, or if you're wrong, Mork and Gork. The two fightinest gods in all the Warhammer universes. You might think that's Korn being a war god and all, but he's got nothing on these two lads. Korn also likes blood to top it off. The green lads don't care about that, they just want to fight and win. So if you're brutally cunning or cunningly brutal, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure which of the adjectives applies to which god, maybe you'll like this video in particular. Because it helped me overcome a writer's block in the best way I can think of. To prepare for this video, I got drunk, turned off my brain cells for a bit, and embraced what it truly means to be green. Let's get started, shall we? And believe it or not, the video on orc gods has given me a lot of theory crafting to do with some amount of intelligent reasoning behind it. You've been forewarned of that now. If that long-winded and barely informational opening paragraph wasn't enough for you, Gork and Mark are the twin gods of the greenskins in all the Warhammer settings. Even Age of Sigmar, where most of the old gods have died, but we'll get to the specifics of that later. It won't be too long, though, because funnily enough, Age of Sigmar has more lore for them than the other two settings. Another point in its favor, I say. I'll start with them in 40k first, since the knowledge there is largely applicable to the other two settings, and I don't need to segue into a sequel setting there. As with all factions relating to the War in Heaven, the true extent of Gork and Mork during those times is unclear. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you a bunch of theories I have, since GW loves to be frustratingly vague on important parts of their setting. I know mysteries stop being interesting when the answer is given, but they also stop being interesting when absolutely nothing is given. The Old Ones created the Orcs to fight the Necrons, that much is clear. What is also known from the more recent Eldar codices is that the Eldar gods were weapons worshipped as gods. I'm personally partial to the belief that they were always the Eldar gods and were just given an upgrade by the old ones, but even if you disagree and think the Eldar pantheon was created solely as weapons, that still means they very much had a hand in assisting the Eldar and by extension their gods. Whether Isha was always a god or created wholesale, or Hell is even an old one herself, she was still influenced by them to some degree. With that in mind, Gork and or Mork could have come about in any numbers of ways. Perhaps the old ones created them as twin gods that they are now. Perhaps they were once Gorka Morka, the singular god with two heads. Or perhaps they came about from the collective orc subconscious. And I don't say quirk subconscious for a key reason. Gork and Mork are just like the orcs. They're belligerent and love fighting. This is noteworthy because while the Krok probably love fighting as much as their descendants, there's a consensus that the Krok were of nothing else slightly more sophisticated than the Orcs. The Orcs had diplomats during the War of the Beast, and they weren't even proper Krok yet. Real Krok would have been probably much more well-spoken, if equally happy to punch you in the jaw. And that's important to this theory of their origin because it's another contrast to the Eldar. The Eldar gods didn't change much over the course of 65 million years. Saren was always the king of the gods, Val was always a blacksmith, Isha was always a goddess of life. No changes in the Eldar subconscious, such as when they started becoming real degenerates, really affected the Eldar gods. They always stayed who they were. They were static. And if one weapon race had gods that were largely static for so long, it would make sense that the Krork gods would have been like the Krork as well. Perhaps it's because the Eldar didn't really devolve in the same manner as the Krork, but the point I'm getting is that unlike the Eldar gods, I think it's a fair thing to argue that Gork and Mork only came about when the Krork had become Orc. Could be wrong though, and like I said, I'm gonna fully admit that a large portion of what you've been hearing has just been theory crafting. I'm talking about the war in heaven, there's only so much I can do in facts. It's also because Gork and Mark aren't exactly brimming with character, even when compared to other 40k gods. Going forward into the time period where they are confirmed Gork and Mork rather than some hypothetical Krork god, there's a few solid things we know about them, and they don't lend themselves much to character development. Gork is the god of being brutal, yet still cunning. Sure, if he's gotta do something sneaky, he probably will, but he's probably also just gonna punch you in the face. 
Mork, meanwhile, is the god of being cunning, yet still brutal. If he's gotta go face to face, he's more than happy, but he's also the one who's gonna be opening with a crotch shot. As for why they have two gods, well, say it with me, everyone. If you only have one god, who's he supposed to fight? What makes Gork and Mork different from most of the rest of the gods in 40k is that they're rather passive. And do please hear me out, Orc fans, I have an explanation for the Orc heresy I've just uttered. Slanesh soloed most of the Eldar Pantheon, Korn finally got off his chair lately, and the Emperor empowers Living Saints regularly. Zinch is so goddamn schemy that I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he's behind at least some of his schemes personally, and Nurgle captured Isha. But Gork and Mork? Intentionally, they rarely interfere with other gods' plans. Much like the orcs themselves, they generally don't invade other gods' domains so much as they happen inside of them. That's a good way to put it, actually. The other gods don't end up fighting Gork and Mork because the twins wanted to fight them, it just kinda happens. Unless you're a farseer and can see the future, this is much the same as with their orc followers. Orc invasions often as not happen because the warboss decided this looks fun, and then suddenly a fortress world is swarming with the bastards. Likewise, Zinch doesn't end up with Gork and Mork outside his house because they wanted to be there. They were probably just in a Looney Tunes dust cloud fighting each other and then suddenly realized they had a spectator they could fight instead. That's not to say they never have any plans. Gazgul is getting as far as he is, at least in part, because Gork and Mork want him to get the big wah going. The two brothers rarely get along, but when they do, the galaxy quakes in fear. It's just that we rarely, if ever, get lore on the machinations of the greenskinned gods or how they're reacting to outside threats. I'm sure this is partly because GW will have their entire lore department commit honorable suicide before giving a proper in-depth Xeno lore expansion, but for once I think it might also be just because GW is only able to do so much with it. The orcs aren't exactly an army with deep motivations, even by 40k standards. Love fighting. That's kinda it. Same goes for their gods. It'd be great if they showed up more often, don't get me wrong, I absolutely want more Gork and Mork. But there's only so many ways you can have Gork and Mork make an appearance, whereas other gods are a lot more versatile with what you can do with them. I imagine it's also partly why there's been so much focus on Nurgle in Warhammer video games of late. He can be a great big bad guy, or he can be more subtle with plagues and taking advantage of people's despair. Compare that to Korn, who also just wants violence. Narratively, you're kind of limited with what you can have Kornate forces be doing, same with the orcs. As for how they fare in fights against other gods, it can go either way, really. Lore has stated that when Gork and or Mork get hit by another god in the warp, they just laugh it off, which would imply they can pretty handily stomp whoever gets in their way. Now, Lore has also stated that the Chaos Gods are the unrivaled masters of the warp, but to once again throw theory crafting at you, there's a couple of explanations for that. For one, you can just say that in either way, the lore is wrong. That either Gork and Mork really are the strongest, or they aren't and they're actually below the Chaos Gods. But for starters, that's potentially more Chaos Wank and therefore stupid and wrong, and for others, that's boring. Going one god is just better is an answer that pleases that army's fans, but no one else's, so allow me to suggest a compromise. Gork and Mork are the strongest powers in the warp, however, they have basically no mastery over it. Orc powers are distinctly different from other Psyker powers, coming from the field all orcs generate around themselves. Perhaps it still comes from the warp in some way, and it naturally can still make a weird boy's head explode, but it's not really the same thing as when a human Psyker rolls for perils. No possession, no whispering voices in his ear, besides maybe those of Mork telling him to cast Eyeball Laser again because it's funny. What I suggest is the compromise between these two blurbs of lore is that when Gork and Mork roll up on one of the Chaos God's turf, they absolutely bowl over them. Korn is enjoying one of his rare days off watching Blood Bowl, and then the Orc brothers bowl into his house, smashing up all the skull furniture and beating him into a paste on accident. When he tries to fight back, they just start doing it on purpose. But it's in a similar vein to Kaldor Drago and how the warp just resets back to normal after he leaves a given area of it. Once the greenskin gods move on, presumably to beat up someone else, the Chaos Gods dust themselves off and resume business as normal. It's almost like a natural disaster, but in hell. This is, again, just how I'm trying to reconcile some conflicting lore, and this is not a definitive case of what is happening. I'm also sure that Out of Universe is another case of GW going, these are the biggest bad guys around, because selling Warhammer armies is built around them depicting them as the best thing ever before the next guy comes along to get the same treatment. Since the plot development of 40k only occasionally explicitly mentions what the gods are doing, the rest of 40k is going to be pretty short. Gork and Mork are happy to empower any random Mork that asks, but they're equally happy not doing that. Gork usually helps the average boy along and is thus more worshipped by them, and Mork is worshipped more by the orcs that have a gimmick. Weird boys, mech boys, all the orcs that aren't just your average lad. If you're thinking that gives Mork a bit of an advantage because he's got more of the capable orcs, remember that Gork is the one who has 99% of the orc race in favor of him. Not that greenskins really worship in the traditional sense or have religious schisms. If one orc likes Gork more, he punches the one who likes Mork more. Mech boys build stompas as idols to Gork and Mork, and the average boy doesn't really care which of the two gods he's technically fighting in the shadows of. That's the end of it, and all greenskins love both gods regardless. 
With Gaskell rising, they became a bit more proactive and started guiding him on how to get all the fellas together for one big religiously motivated bar brawl, but aside from that, they don't really do too much. The Great Rift is known as Gork's Grin to the Orcs, and to them it's a great place to randomly be thrown around somewhere to fight new stuff. That is just about the extent of the Great Rift affecting Gork, Mork, and the Greenskins at large. And that's all I'm gonna cover for 40k as well, so let's move on to fantasy. In Warhammer Fantasy, they're pretty much the same. One likes fighting directly, the other likes fighting but sometimes indirectly, and the two gods are largely unchanged. The difference largely comes in who they're worshipped by. If it's 99% of orcs favoring Gork in 40k, it's 99.999 favoring Gork in fantasy. This is made up for by the fact that the goblins primarily worship Mork, and there's a whole lot more importance placed on goblins than Grotz. So what happens as a result of this change? Again, not much. I guess they're a little bit more proactive in fantasy, since everyone from Grimwar to Grom has heard their voices in their head. Orzag especially hears their voices, and he's more than happy to dance his way to wherever they tell him to go. The magic of the orcs but with a C instead of a K is once again different to normal Warhammer fantasy magic, directly coming from the orc gods themselves. In a way, that means that every orc wizard is technically a paladin. That's awesome. The biggest differences in fantasy comes in their origins and their version of having a single greenskin be their prophet. The origins are that they're just kinda there. It's a complete fantasy setting, so a violent belligerent god doesn't need to have its origins theorized about like with the old ones over in 40k. The orcs have always been there, the gods have always been there too, that's it. Stop asking questions. Sometimes human scholars have theorized that Gork and Mark might actually just be corn in disguise, and others have said that in either case the end result is still hordes of greenskins, so it's probably not worth worrying about asking questions. They do also have idols made in their image, constructed out of literal shit, and sometimes those idols come to life. But their prophet? Yeah, that's something different than in 40k, because with the end times, we've come to realize that two gods just having one prophet doesn't make a lot of sense. And sure enough, in Warhammer Fantasy, there is no singular prophet of Gork and Mork like with Gazi. Instead, Wurzag delivered news to two separate greenskins that they would be the prophet of one god each. Grimgor Ironhide was the prophet of Gork, and Skarsnik was the prophet of Mork. And these two greenskins, one orc and one gabo, would rain destruction and bring about the Wa to end all Wa's that would shake down the foundations of the world itself. Or they would've if this wasn't the end times. Yeah, I know. But hey, cheer up a bit. Out of all the characters of the end times, Grimgor was the only one to have a true shot at killing Archeon. He nearly did, and Archeon lost his future-seeing helmet and had to shatter his sword and unleash the demon inside of it to kill Grimgor. As for Skarsnik, he was leading the remaining orcs off-screen. This is both fitting as his nature of being Mork's prophet means he's a bit more tactically inclined, and because the writers forgot about him during the end times, so he doesn't get to do anything more important than that, unfortunately. And for more reasons to cheer up, it's because the world ending wasn't enough to get these two gods killed off. Apparently off-screen between the two settings, two things happened. They fused into a singular god, Gorka Morka, and were trapped in a god beast consisting entirely of sentient amber. Sigmar came along and figured, whatever, he has to kill that thing eventually, so he might as well free the two of them. When he does, Gorka Morka says thanks and then decks Sigmar right in the jaw. They fight for a week straight and then eventually look around and start laughing, both happy to have found another deity that loves fighting as much as the other does. Sigmar tasks Gorka Morka and his children with fighting the various things in the mortal realms that would threaten civilization which is just about most of reality at this point. And thus was the god of the orcs of all people the defender of civilization. Although defender has some connotations to it that don't really fit. He didn't really defend, for example. Sigmar told him that X was a problem, and then Gorkamorka would make X no longer a problem. In fact, once Gorkamorka started being more of a defender because he had killed most of the things threatening the burgeoning mortal realms, issues started cropping up. He realized that eventually he wouldn't really be able to fight things properly as all threats to civilization were blown away, and the other gods probably wouldn't want him smashing his toys. He realized his technical subordinate Bayamot was having a lot more fun on account of having more freedoms to smash things than Gorkamorka did. And eventually he just came to the realization that to him this was all a load of horseshit. Zeech also whispered into his ear that Sigmar wasn't giving him the treatment he deserved, but do you really think Zeech needed to do a lot to get Gorkamorka going? He probably just whispered the word fight into his ear a couple of times, and that was all he needed to do to set him off. Gorkamorka in Age of Sigmar was the first deity to piss off from Sigmar's pantheon alongside his followers. He did so in the orkiest way possible. Declare war on all of reality, then march across it. When they got to the end, the plan was to turn around and do it all over. It fell into infighting before it could fully finish, and Gork and Morka split once more into Gork and Mork, but the damage was already done. The orcs were no longer allied to Sigmar, and Grand Alliance destruction could finally be its own thing. They've largely made the Realm of Beasts their home, because nothing says home like a reality where everything around is alive and wants you dead. It's a good thing there aren't any orcs on Catacan, because they'd probably instantly level up into Krork. Then chaos invades, all of reality is broken, and things get worse for everyone. Gorkamorka is pretty much the only one not upset at this. Chaos loves a fight, 
gives him a great fight, and this time no one will complain about things like collateral damage. He was briefly unsplit and was last seen at the Battle of Burning Skies, the final battle before Sigmar officially gave up and went home to create the Stormcast, and by what few accounts exist, gave a pretty good showing of things. This was the last time anyone saw him. Of news beyond that, when Sigmar sent some Stormcast Eternals to try and meet with them to open up diplomatic talks, Skadrak told them that Gorkamorka had no interest in talking to anyone. Aside from all that, business as usual. Gorkamorka might be Gork and Mork at any given point, and the various destruction factions worship or at least revere him in a variety of different guises. The Ogres worship him as the Great Maw 2.0, for example, and the various destruction factions all have myths about the mortal realms and how they came to be from the various actions Gorkamorka took. And that's about it for the Greenskin God's lore. But how about them on Tabletop? Well, if that truly existed, I'd love to tell you, but unfortunately you can't properly play him on Tabletop. That would be a bit broken, although in fairness, Nagash is the head of Grand Alliance Death and the God of Death, and he's got a mini, so who knows what lays in the future. But they do still have a presence, believe it or not. The Foot of Gork. Enemy unit takes d6 mortal wounds. If you roll a 4 or higher, it keeps going, until you eventually roll a 3 or under, or the enemy unit dies. And it's probably my favorite spell, because it's a divine intervention taken to its funniest extreme. Sure, you could empower a hero to fight beyond their limits, or arrange events from behind the scenes in such a way that they play out in your favor, or you could stomp the shit out of whatever is bothering your followers. Now that's proper orky. And that's Gork and Mork. Much like the Greenskins themselves, you can beat Gork and Mork today, but you can never get rid of them. They'll always come back laughing and ready for round two. Thank you, of course, to my wonderful channel members. You are the Gork and Mork to my Greenskin. Sure, I technically don't need you to be fighting, but without you, it just wouldn't be the same. And it sure as hell would be a lot harder in my life without you. Might have to get a real job. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. It is, just so we're all clear on this, Gork and Mork. If you say Mork and Gork, I'm gonna be outside your window tonight. If you don't have a window I can look in from, I'll be standing at the edge of your street. And if you're in a location where I cannot see you from the outside, have no contact with the outside world, and are completely shut off, then all I have to say to you is, please go outside. Touch grass, say hi to another human being. It's not healthy to avoid sunlight that long, you fucking nerd. Go do something.